to kind of uh, uh, stay within like one hour, maybe one hour, 15, 20 minutes, not yeah. longer. Otherwise it's becoming like really uh, difficult, especially like, you know, in the end of the day and when everyone probably had few presentations, Zoom, Zoom <laughs> sessions before, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. And your question like? Okay, hello everyone. Um, okay, hello everyone. We're starting our eighth uh, uh, discussion within the series uh, Get Real, um, uh, online series Get Real, which is a part of the, our uh, ongoing uh, project uh, Critical Mass, fifth season of Critical Mass we are a curatorial duo talk and uh, creative association of curators and uh, Anne Bitkin and my colleague Marie Vietz. Hello, hello. Uh, we, uh, um, uh, we work as a nomadic curatorial collective for more than 10 years and uh, uh, we work within this um, multidisciplinary field uh, trying to discuss uh, many, um, many pressing and uh, urgent socio-political issues within the curatorial and artistic domain. We work on the, between uh, visual practice, uh, sociological research, and uh, uh, we work with people from very different uh, fields of knowledge, uh, Besides artists and curators, we work with sociologists and architects and historians. And uh, um, we would, we have um, um, our practice use, usually very durational. We have projects that lasting for several years and we work very often outside of white cubes in uh, public spaces in uh, educational and cultural institution. Uh, landing on uh, different uh, political and social contexts. Um, one of our projects, which is at the, lo the longest project, uh, which we conduct since 2010, to, to, uh, from the beginning of uh, us as an as a organization of, uh, and collective, is, uh, is Critical Mass. And uh, the series of discussions, Get Real, is a part of fifth season of Critical Mass because the project is uh, naturally uh, uh, dividing into different seasons and each season working with different problematics. And Marsha will talk about the focus of the fifth season and the Get Real uh, discussion and introduce Marcia as our speaker today. Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> uh, Get Real is this uh, kind of um, satellite project of the fifth season of uh, Critical Mass, which is dedicated to housing. Um, which we kind of try to explore from different perspectives um, um, and using different strategies from different areas of knowledge, trying to unpack what housing is and what housing as a question, what are the housing answers ba basically to um, the housing question. And um, by kind of creating this knowledge platform where we invite people from different disciplines, um, artists, curators, sociologists, historians, um, active citizens were trying to kind of um, take out the housing question out, out of a disciplinary isolation because we know that housing maybe um, um, only kind of recently started to be a theme for many artistic investigations and curatorial um, um, focuses. So we also kind of trying to understand how we can decolonize this theme, how we can um, look at it from different perspective and how we can also maybe uh, offer a new uh, cognitive apparatuses for uh, decolonizing and exploring the, um, um, the housing discourse and what it represents um, today. And we also believe that um, we kind of, um, you know, trying to do that. To do that, we also um, um, look in more detail into different factors that, um, you know, kind of um, connected to housing and how these factors also um, affect our bodies, our consciousness, our health, our experiences, our social connections, um, how they maybe change or reproduce certain social structures. So um, um, together with our audiences, we're trying to, to zoom into particular specific cases 
And today we're, we're going to be looking into um, a, a case of um, Riga and more uh, maybe um, uh, widely into the, the Baltic um, context. And um, our speaker today is um, uh, Matis Groskaufmanis. He's an architect and educator. He's currently based at the Aarhus School of Architecture, where he holds a position of a teaching assistant professor. And his research and design work mostly examines architecture's relationship to economies of production with a specific focus on the management uh, of design practice. Uh, in 2019-2020, uh, he was the Sanders Fellow at the University of Michigan's uh, Talman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. And in 2018, he served as a curator of the Latvian Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennial, exploring housing as a means of nation building. He is alumnus of the Strelka Institute for Media Architecture and Design in Moscow, holds a master's degree in architecture with distinction uh, from Delft University of Technology and a bachelor's degree in architecture from Glasgow School of Art. Uh, and previously, Matis has worked on research, publishing and building projects as a part of Rotterdam-based architecture practices, uh, OMA, AMO, I'm not sure I'm uh, pronouncing correctly, maybe you can correct me, and uh, MD, MVRD. So, Matis, uh, we're very happy that you have joined us um, today. Thank you very much for um, being with us, and the floor is yours. Uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Anna and Marcia, for inviting me. Uh, the pleasure is mine. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to fit in 25 minutes, but if it's really kind of exceeding that, don't hesitate to just uh, signal. <laughs> Um, all right, and, and hello to everyone who is virtually gonna, who has tuned in to this uh, talk as well tonight. Um, all right, let me try to uh, share my screen. Uh, wait just a second. All right, I hope it's visible. Um, so, I mean, I got the invitation to this talk and I was thinking, uh, I, could, I mean, there are so many things that I, I want to maybe look into and, and talk about in regard to housing, especially housing today, and maybe especially in, about housing in 2021. Uh, uh, and, 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 and let's see how far we get. Um, but in general, I have been engaged with the question of housing for some time, uh, uh, both uh, as one of the kind of curators at Latin Pavilion in Venice Architecture Biennale, but also in my teaching and research. And in fact, even now, uh, I'm teaching in a design studio where my students are designing housing as well. So I feel that uh, there are different things that I've been doing as part of my practice, but kind of housing is always kind of uh, at one of the kind of core uh, themes that uh, is kind of uh, uh, yeah uh, looking at. Um, at the same time, uh, I think it's important to make a disclaimer that um, I'm trained as an architect and not as a policy expert, not as a sociologist, not uh, as an engineer, not as an economist. And I think all of those disciplines are incredibly important when it comes to housing and the kind of production and of housing and shaping policy of housing. Um, so, and, and quite often, uh, maybe more important than what architects can do, especially I think in today's uh, uh, conditions. Um, so I think just to be kind of transparent, I think the, the value that I, I will try to bring maybe with my presentation is talk about, let's say some kind of like approximate uh, structural overview of some of those questions uh, that I think uh, me as an architect, uh, uh, yeah, that's something that, that I can um, uh, offer. Um, and in my talk, I will, uh, it will definitely oscillate between uh, concrete examples and very abstract uh, takes on certain questions. So uh, let's just, let's say an important disclaimer. Um, I, I also want to maybe uh, set the background a bit. I mean, I think there are different ways you can look at housing. And I think uh, whether we look at what is happening in architectural practice, when architects are really kind of working with the developers and developments, to make housing uh, in relation to, or in, in comparison to what, uh, how, what are the questions that are dominating the academia in, the, in regard to housing? What are the questions that are being explored, especially in kind of like design studio of academia, uh, of architecture education? Um, and, and I think that uh, these things are not too well uh, uh, connected. And I think that there are different ways to 
maybe approach uh, 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 this uh, question. And there are different focal points as well, right? Because housing is also okay, so many different things. Um, so to, tonight, I want to really talk about apartments and, uh, and particularly focus not on detached dwellings or other kind of uh, kinds of dwellings, really talk about the apartment as some kind of like very kind of important, let's say architectural and economical and political invention. And, and in a way to kind of try to maybe sketch out some of the kind of consequences that kind of, uh, or some of the effects that apartment has kind of uh, uh, produced over the last, let's say more or less hundred years in kind of, in the context of uh, Northeast Europe and Latvia in particular. Um, and, and I want to say that I think uh, the way that I always have looked at uh, uh, housing, I think is really kind of uh, primarily through the kind of perspective of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, material concerns and, and economics. Um, again, we, we, can, we can, of course, justify the idea of apartment uh, as a kind of like a form of communal living, as a form of uh, togetherness, as a form of social togetherness. Um, and, but at least in my work, it's, it's, it's somehow always, uh, uh, I've looked at it as some kind of like economical construct, as a way to basically economically op optimize uh, way, ways of accommodating people. And I think quite, I think it's pretty straightforward uh, observation in a way that even if we go to, let's say, I don't know, even American cities, but even in Europe, you could see that many detached houses, especially over the over the last decades, uh, are being kind of converted into apartment uh, 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 dwellings. Uh, let's say they are being apartmentalized uh, again because of economic uh, pressures and probably the kind of scarcity of resources, scarcity of uh, uh, land, and let's say maybe kind of uh, shrinking real income of populations, uh, both in Europe and US, and probably in other parts of the world too. Um, so that's that. Um, so, and probably, I mean, one of the kind of my first encounters, especially with, with the housing question and the apartment in particular in the kind of Northeastern Europe uh, was in 2011 when I spent a year at Strelka, when we really looked at kind of broader ecosystems of housing production. Um, and I think that for me, at least, that was a time when kind of, uh, you know, this kind of like, uh, when I arrived in Moscow, I was incredibly kind of, uh, 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 I was, astonished to see the kind of incredible intensity of apartment housing that is basically constituting uh, probably the vast majority of built environment, <laughs> definitely in, in the periphery of Moscow. Uh, and, and it was quite, uh, I'm just, just, just as an architect seeing that site, I kind of immediately kind of uh, signaled that, that this, it's something that uh, is, is kind of very important uh, uh, to look at. Um, so I had a better chance maybe to explore uh, the apartment and apartment living um, when we uh, when, I, when, I, when I was appointed uh, along with my colleagues uh, Evelyn Ozoel, uh, Gunda Galaivin, and Anders Krajane uh, as curators of the Latvian Pavilion uh, at the Venice Architecture Biennale in yeah, 2018. Um, we had different experiences before, uh, and so there were people, sort of part of our curatorial team really came from the background of theater and stage design, and also urbanism. I came from the background of architecture. So in a way, that kind of like a collage of, of different personalities in a way also formed the way that we conducted this uh, exhibition, which is was presented in an architecture biennale, but at the same time uh, contained elements of many different uh, kind of uh, uh, things. And, and even in aesthetic terms, maybe they did, did not, let's say, follow some kind of canonical ideas of, of architectural representation um, in some respects. Um, um, and and in, in hindsight, I think there are many things that we could and maybe should talk about Venice Architectural Biennale and the kind of merit of its very existence, especially, I think, from today's perspective. And maybe we can leave it as a conversation for uh, another occasion and, and not tonight. But, I, but what I wanted to indicate is that at least for us, uh, this was just a chance to mobilize uh, resources and people and to look at that particular issue uh, with a really kind of a generous uh, funding and support by Latvian Ministry of Culture uh, that probably wouldn't be possible in any, any other circumstances. Um, in, in other words, uh, this exhibition was definitely made uh, for Venice uh, in its form maybe, uh, but in its content, it was definitely more uh, trying to in a way, uh, look at Latvian context from some kind of external perspective. So in a way, they're going to step out from the everyday environment and try to make an exhibition about that environment and just exhibit it elsewhere. 
Um, and later, of course, we, moved, we remade this exhibition in Latvia as well, but that's uh, again, a different story. Um, so I think we, we got fascinated by apartment living uh, and basically just basically that that was our main uh, 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 focus. Um, it turns out that in terms of numbers, um, while Latvia was is one of the kind of least densely populated uh, territories of Europe, basically it's like empty. Uh, um, it has landmass that is bigger than Netherlands uh, with, with 16 or 17 million inhabitants. And Latvia is like 1.9 million people living there. Uh, uh, and at, at the same time, in this kind of like very kind of uh, sparsely uh, populated uh, territory, uh, there's a highest kind of ratio of people who live in kind of high density apartment dwellings in whole Europe, uh, which was also kind of something that came up uh, during our initial study uh, of this matter. Um, and, and it's something that definitely kind of uh, 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 is kind of almost like a counterintuitive uh, when, when you look at some kind of like local mythologies of individual living these like detached houses and let's say the kind of overall fetishization of uh, let's say villas and individually kind of designed uh, detached homes as a kind of main focal point of architectural discourse uh, and let's say I would say that up, on, up until 2016 2017 the kind of housing question on a mass scale or on a collective scale was not too popular um, uh, of a topic, let's say, in architectural circles. Uh, it, it was very much about, it, it was something that people just didn't want to talk about, or it wasn't interesting, or maybe it wasn't prestigious enough, and, and so on. So in a way, we tried to use this exhibition to kind of uh, really try to, maybe try to nudge the, the architectural discourse, at least in, in, in the re original context, to start talking about these things, to start looking at everyday living on the kind of everyday conditions that most of the people of the country live. Uh, which it is like kind of you know more or less high density uh, uh, con con condition and not a, a detached uh, 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 home. And so in, in the exhibition, we try to in a way make sense of all of this and to see where where this where the apartment really comes from in, in a Latvian kind of ar architectural context and, and how did it come about and and why is it that there is so much of a kind of uh, empty space, but in fact everyone is kind of compressed in the, or most people are compressed in those. Uh, apartments, which is like two thirds of population is, are living in kind of apartment blocks. Um, so in the research, we, we basically went back uh, 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 looking at certain snapshots. Of course, we didn't want, want to rewrite the whole history, but we wanted to look at certain snapshots of, of time in the past hundred years, uh, up from the kind of like establishment of the kind of modern Latvian state, and just to really see uh, uh, you know how uh, in the individual apartment has played some kind of role in, in different ways of, kind of social and political and economical uh, reform. So in other ways, again, really looking at uh, more of the externalities of architecture and, and less, let's say, of the, the kind of architectural in, in kind of like you know, uh, more like the disciplinary terms like form or, or, or uh, function and so on. Um, so. And I think that, that in a way this really starts with kind of modernization. Um, and I think the the apartment, and I, I think again, I mean, in, in to a large extent, there are many things that I will show and talk about that are kind of almost repetitive, uh, depending on whichever kind of uh, country you pick from the kind of Northeast European uh, sphere or the post-Soviet sphere. There are many things that you could relate to and find familiar. Um, but at least for, for me, I think what, what, is, what, what was important in this study is to kind of discover that, that the apartment wasn't a product of Soviet modernization, but it already was like a very important kind of, uh, kind of let's say, biopolitical instrument uh, in, in kind of 1920s, um, when, when, when the kind of social democratic uh, kind of uh, uh, political uh, direction was prevalent in Latvia. And, and there was a, a lot of excitement about things that are happening in Western Europe, especially Vienna. The kind of Viennese left-leaning politics of housing, Red Vienna, and so on. Um, so, so it, it was a time when, of course, uh, it was just after the First World War. Uh, there was kind of a, a lot of need to rebuild and, and modernize and kind of rescue uh, and, in a way, kind of clean up also uh, the, the, the city in terms that many people were living in unsanitary conditions. There was like a massive housing crisis. Um, so, what we see here is a a pamphlet that actually, as you see, it's in, in, in Latvian and in German. Um, again, uh, you could see many parallels with kind of these so-called infographics that were also part of, uh, let's say, Viennese housing discourse. So, so, so there was a lot of inspiration in that, it seems. Uh, so, so this image kind of tries to show uh, the housing shortage, the housing crisis. So 
So the big building, the tower, uh, indicates the kind of uh, how many apartments are missing. And then these tiny houses uh, indicate how many uh, kind of new apartments are completed. And, and then the, the tiniest house without a roof on the right side indicates the kind of things that are under, const under construction. So basically, in, in, so, so this kind of like go ghostly tower indicates the housing crisis. And then these tiny houses indicate actually what is available. Um, and I think it's a very kind of perfect kind of image uh, to encapsulate the situation in the 20s and, and why there was this obsession with uh, apartment uh, as a way to kind of solve the housing crisis, right? Because uh, we, we went to archives and it was interesting to look at even in kind of like public sector uh, uh, discussions, city municipality uh, uh, protocols from their meetings, there was even this kind of question, like, should we build row houses? Should we build apartments? What should we really do? Uh, and the apartment was uh, proclaimed as kind of uh, the most efficient way to do it. it. It was the quickest way because you can build one street and you can fit many houses on that, on, on, on that street using the same kind of utility connections and so on. So it was very like much like a utilitarian uh, uh, solution in a way uh, to the question of how to uh, accommodate, uh, uh, you know, these new kind of masses in the city that are living in unsanitary conditions. Um, and I think one of the interesting things is that also, and I think now we, we also can talk in parallel to how to talk about housing in exhibition context, how, how to talk about uh, archival materials uh, uh, in exhibition context. Uh, so what you see here is a drawing uh, that we commissioned to an illustrator, Sander Etema, who is based in the Netherlands. We basically had a bunch of kind of uh, basically a bunch of documents from archives from 1920s that were kind of indicating uh, different complaints that tenants made who were living in these new built uh, social democratic kind of uh, leaning public housing estates. Uh, and, and it was only text and there was no visual material. So we asked the illustrator to kind of draw a comic to indicate uh, uh, some of those kind of daily scenes to kind of show the, kind of the realities of housing shortage. So this is a, a true story from 1920s about first few people who moved into these new, new, newly modernized uh, uh, housing blocks. Uh, they had a, they had a shower for, for the first time ever. They had a shower at home. So then all the neighbors were queuing outside their door to only be able to also experience the shower uh, every other day. And then all the, all the other neighbors were complaining that there is unknown people coming in and taking shower in one of those uh, brand new apartments. Um, so in, in a way, and, and this is something that we actually included in the exhibition, um, again, trying to kind of translate this kind of, uh, kind of dry historical uh, factual events into maybe some kind of other kind of form of content that maybe is almost sort of a caricature, but also maybe tries to kind of uh, portray the severity of, kind of again, living conditions uh, uh, at, at, at that uh, time. And, and of course, like uh, like a kitchen and sanitary facilities were like one of the kind of key things, right? This was the way to 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 accommodate and to kind of also fight diseases, right? Because it, there was a kind of um, quite a uh, uh, you know it wasn't just like a housing crisis; it was also a public health crisis when when, when uh, I think things like tuberculosis were spreading in Europe at that time, and and and, and the, the, there were all kinds of architectural responses to that, which of course we know very well. Um, and housing was a part of a kind of public health policy as well, right? How do you get enough daylight? How do you get enough fresh air circulating? How do you heat uh, uh, these things? And what we see here is by the, that time, uh, a, a modern uh, uh, kitchen. Uh, and if you look carefully on the left side, between uh, the stovetop and the sink, there is a bathtub as well. So this is something in between a kitchen and a bathroom, uh, quite basic from maybe today's perspective. Uh, but at that, that time, that was a way to kind of, uh, in a way, kind of, let's say, to produce some kind of housing mobility or upwards mobility in housing uh, for, for uh, people, for urban dwellers. So from 1920s and from that era, I think the most notable project in Riga was uh, this kind of massive estate in uh, Asar Iela or Asar Street. Uh, um, it was kind of uh, very much inspired again from the kind of Viennese housing examples and, and particularly from Karl Markshoff estate, which probably is one of the most canonical kind of uh, uh, examples, built examples of collective housing from Red Vienna. Um, and in a way, it, it had a lot of influence, uh, probably uh, in, in many parts of Europe as a model, as an, as an idea. Um, so this is one of the projects that they wanted to build uh, this estate for 
10,000 uh, 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 new inhabitants. And as you see here on, on the rooftop, they are even, they have put these Latvian flags to kind of like indicate some kind of, uh, I guess, modernization or, or uh, some kind of like op optimism or, or idea of a future newly established uh, uh, state. Um, and as you see here, this is, this is like a rendering, or we could call it rendering. Uh, nowadays, probably it will be more like a sketch. Uh, but this was actually published in the newspaper. This was the full full size uh, housing estate. So you can see the kind of immense scale of that ambition. Uh, the idea was to demolish old workers' housing and in a way to kind of re replace it with this modern, high density uh, kind of apartment blocks, again, for like a thousand uh, uh, units. Um, of course, uh, that thing uh, didn't uh, happen um, because they, there was not, not enough capital. This thing was in progress. Uh, and then the 1930s kind of Great Depression uh, that kind of canceled all the kind of first efforts on building this kind of new wave of apartment blocks in, in Riga. Um, and so what you see here is actually a model that we uh, are commissioned to kind of show the kind of initial promise of that project, which you see this is like kind of a, a massive housing estate uh, with many courtyards, which again formally resembles Karl Markshoff um, to some extent. Um, but then we also see that in a way only a, a fraction of that was built. So on the right side, you see the part that actually was built and the rest is this like a promise, this ambition of future that never really materialized and, and it was kind of like over time uh, um, abolished. So what, what we basically talked about un up, so, up until this point is this kind of first effort of this kind of first, first kind of wave of, let's say, apartmentalization or, or new idea of kind of like more modern housing as a way to kind of yeah, accommodate, um, yeah, the kind of uh, the urban uh, population. Um, and this effort was short lived, um, but it certainly kind of, let's say, set a certain tone uh, you know, so, so this idea of a new, clean, warm, uh, well-lit uh, uh, and ventilated uh, apartment remained as a kind of certain promise of, you know, social democratic uh, reform, a certain idea of uh, togetherness uh, uh, in the city and or let's say, the togetherness of, of living in, in the city. Um, and what we see here is uh, a courtyard of one of the other estates built from the same era, uh, and you have all the children who actually uh, are from the nursery, which was part of this uh, the de development. So the, the idea was that uh, not just to provide uh, living uh, functions, but also some kind of social functions. Um, and, and this is kind of one of the, and, and this still exists. Uh, it doesn't look so nice nowadays, but but you, you can still see, I think, uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure if the fountain is there, but uh, it's uh, you can still find traces of that uh, today. Um, so, of course, after uh, Latvia was annexed uh, by the Soviet Union, uh, of course, the kind of housing uh, took a different turn. And, of course, many things that maybe in terms of like different architectural doctrines that existed at that time, maybe, maybe that's uh, something that is common knowledge and we shouldn't touch upon too much because, of course, Stalin has had one idea of architecture and then it was all cancelled by Khrushchev who had another idea of architecture and, and so on. Um, I think what is important to mention is that uh, it was a time of great uh, kind of uh, demographic uh, change, and there was uh, there was a considerable inward migration of, let's say, new workers who are ar arriving to participate in building the kind of like uh, kind of Soviet industry, the Soviet e economy. There also was a, a lot of military personnel who were kind of still located in Latvia after the Second World War. So of course, the kind of housing question was very much still on the agenda. Um, and, and of course, it was never solved entirely, but there was a, a lot of effort to do that and arguably also a lot of success in doing that, especially with the kind of a mass housing. Um, which, what, what we are looking here now is a poster. It's one of many that kind of tries to kind of promote this idea that uh, in the next 10 to 12 years, uh, we will uh, kind of um, ameliorate all the kind of housing shortages in the country. So this, there was this idea that this is from 1957, uh, I believe, uh, and, and and this is a promise of, of kind of like solving the housing crisis through this like mass construction. And it's interesting that if you really look look into an archive of these posters, every five years they kind of kept remaking them with new graphics and always kind of postponing the, the kind of sol the solution of housing crisis. So there was always this idea that just wait five more years and we're going to do it. And then after five years, there was like a new poster trying to kind of instigate this idea that that uh, that we need more time. That but 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 we are nearly there. So 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 it's kind of in, in a way, 
the the apartment housing construction was this kind of like one of those like dimensions of this kind of constant kind of progress of Soviet modernization, but also this kind of promise that that, that kind of kept uh, kept move, kind of moving ahead along with uh, uh, time. Um, so I, I think the 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 apartment housing program, uh, just like many other parts of the let's say the kind of Soviet em empire in a way, uh, uh, was kind of really a, a way to kind of. Uh, leave some kind of spatial footprint on, on these yeah, like uh, new territories. Um, and probably many researchers could tell you about regional differences of these apartment blocks uh, or, or, or different typologies maybe, or maybe different construction methods depending on which part of the Soviet Union this was built. Um, but in general, it kind of followed uh, uh, kind of a pretty well-known 20th century mass prefab uh, kind of housing uh, uh, a principle. And in a way, again, the, the apartment was a way of of kind of uh, you know rapidly uh, uh, modernizing cities, expanding uh, uh, kind of inhabitable uh, um, square meters, um, and I, and I think it's important to note that this whole kind of stack of housing production, from concrete panels to urban plans to even individual furniture sizes, they were all part of some kind of like a total cybernetic uh, schema that were kind of mediated by some kind of protocols of absolute uh, standardization. Um, and, and in a way, it's kind of really interesting that, uh, and what you see here actually is a spread from a book that we also published along the exhibition, uh, because we have a lot of really interesting archive material that wasn't really published anywhere else, at least in the Latvian context, uh, that we found in archives. And we thought that we really need to kind of tell that story and to make a volume, a printed volume that would somehow maybe kind of encapsulate some of those things. So at least, uh, let's say, also with the idea that uh, any, any kind of further research uh, uh, maybe could benefit from uh, from what also we did with the exhibition uh, as well, just to kind of again bring it up to this question, try to kind of uh, uh, consolidate the certain material. Um, and I think it's interesting to kind of maybe talk about parallels between the way that it was organized uh, on both sides of the uh, Iron Curtain, because of course, if, if we look at what's been built in in, in in Germany, but even like Scandinavia, uh, uh, to a large extent, uh, these these apartment projects are quite similar in, in their construction technique, even in their space standards and 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 so on. So I think that and that that's that that's an important kind of thing to uh, mention. Um, and of course, I think it's important to to note that also the this idea of building new towns or or, or expanding the the size of cities was also kind of a in, in in a way to uh, um, as, as I mentioned before to kind of in a way as, as a kind of, kind of a tool to uh, expand and 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 reinforce the kind of like you know the kind of Soviet stack into these different kind of new territories. Uh, this is an archive photo of the city of Yalgava, which is like a medium-sized city in Latvia, um, and it shows this kind of celebration that was orchestrated. Uh, 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 let's say uh, uh, on the kind of uh, event of uh, the city being connected to a new gas pipeline uh, that it had now that now the city was connected to the kind of like larger kind of network of 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 uh, uh, kind of uh, Soviet gas that was something that natural gas could be could freely flow and be delivered uh, uh, to this city and. Uh, and, and and you see in this photo that uh, that they have this like uh, kind of like a torch that, that is improvised that is built to kind of celebrate this occasion, and again on the background we see all these like newly built uh, kind of apartment housing blocks, uh, uh, kind of uh, celebrating uh, uh, of Soviet kind of uh, science uh, uh, and uh, yeah some scientific uh, discourse. Um, and and again I think we we talk about gas pipelines, but but it, it was part of. Uh, again, the kind of the kind of immense uh, construction of apartment housing, and just to give a, give it give a bit of context to this, uh, even nowadays, uh, still the vast majority of uh, residential apartment housing area in Latvia, at least, is built in the Soviet era. So it was like an immense uh, kind of uh, uh, effort in a way, uh, and and uh, of course, uh, different historians and designers could say different things about how. How the Soviet housing development uh, played out, but I think it's difficult to deny that it was some sort of an achievement in terms of the amount of square meters that, that they managed to generate in a way through this very kind of standardized uh, uh, program. Um, and here you see what, this is one of my favorite images. Uh, there are two architects discussing plans for the agricultural new town uh, called Nakotne, or in English that means future. So new town called future, which I think is again very emblematic to 
the idea of, 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 of this whole kind of whole kind of Soviet kind of discourse about progress and, and the kind of this radiant future. Um, and so, and I think this image perfectly also embodies kind of like, a, let's say, a, a spirit of the time, right? So this is like this new ostensibly non-capitalist uh, society where uh, that basically is kind of like uh, guided by, by science, guided by some kind of like, I guess, collective idea. Uh, and again, the like housing is is one of those like instruments to kind of, in a way, uh, 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 in a way, de deploy that project on this like empty landscape. So you see on the background, you, you see the horizon, you see just empty fields, uh, probably agri agricultural fields, because this was like an agriculturally kind of oriented development, right? With collective farm, um, and then you just have these like apartment blocks that are just being like dropped onto this like empty landscape to kind of, uh, in a way, provide uh, homes for new agricultural workers. Uh, but, but also, of course, again, to kind of like in a way to manifest the kind of like, you know, in a way like colonial presence of, of this kind of Soviet uh, uh, infrastructure of the Soviet power uh, in these new territories. Um, so after the implosion of the uh, Soviet project, uh, the most radical transformation of the apartment uh, was no, no, let's say it's not in terms of architecture or design or modernization. In a way, the apartment kind of lost some kind of, uh, let's say, ide ideological uh, aspect to it. it. It was they were just there, especially in the nineties. Um, so there was no ide ideology to really cling onto, but the market. The people were just living in those kind of previously state-owned apartments that were like there was no no rent almost to pay. It was very kind of affordable. Those who had had them, of course. Um, but of course, then, then I think the, the, the whole idea of apartment shifted, uh, that suddenly it was all about the individual ownership, right? So the concept of private property had to be introduced. And you could imagine that there are many generations of people who lived uh, like paying a very mod modest amount of rent in one of those kind of, you know, Soviets uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, mass produced apartment blocks. And suddenly uh, it's 90s and they have to kind of rethink what it is where they live into that it's not just a, a, an apartment that is kind of available to them or they have used right for it but suddenly it becomes their property uh, and maybe it sounds very obvious from today's perspective but it definitely was not obvious um, at, at that uh, uh, moment so in, in, a, in a way we looked into it a lot um, and I think it's quite interesting to see that, that, that there was a lot of, let's say, uh, public kind of, there were many public campaigns and informative publications uh, trying to teach people how to own property, right? Uh, it, again, it might sound absurd, but so this is a, a still from a TV show, uh, sort of like in, like an infomercial, and it's called uh, Mans Bus Mans, or in, in English, that would be like, what is mine shall be mine, um, which also has got a very, very indicative title. Um, and, and in a way, it kind of indicates uh, uh, like the, the shift that people had to learn how to use these like uh, vouchers that were issued by the, by the government and how to kind of privatize or gain ownership of, of the apartments in which they lived in. Uh, and there were also booklets that were printed uh, trying to kind of like inform people about what does a private owner need to know um, and, 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 and so on. So I, I think that it's kind of a very in, interesting moment uh, um, in a way. And I, I think it's also important to, to note that um, in, in a way, like I think this was the moment when the apartment really kind of, at least in, in North East European context, and a bit like on the kind of uh, Soviet side of the Iron Curtain, I think this was a moment when, when housing got privatized that suddenly the house, the apartment became a really valuable uh, uh, asset. And in a way, the idea of living in an apartment uh, as a kind of architectural category uh, started to kind of signify interdependence, right? Of, of this like late modern society that suddenly you own something, but whatever, whatever you own actually is physically and infrastructurally and legally connected to things that other people are owning, right? So, so whenever, whenever you think like, how can you own, owning a house is different than owning an apartment, right? Because owning an apartment always implies that whatever you own is also owned by someone else on the other side of the wall. Um, so it, it was a very kind of, kind of fundamental ideological shift in thinking about, again, what does it mean to live in an apartment? Um, and I think it's also important to know that uh, as, as, as a result of that, um, just, yeah. 
uh, in a way there, there, there was a, a kind of a serious kind of economical consequences of this kind of like mass privatization of apartments, right? Because that, that was the main form of, of housing that was available to people. Um, Oh, wait, I think I mixed up the slides. Um, so let's say after the first decades, uh, from 90s to, to 2000s, uh, the, and let's say many new developments sprung up and, and there was this like uh, idea that uh, suddenly like, actually actually the only after 2000s, something like that, like really kind of, uh, let's say the idea of new build apartments picked up. Uh, uh, and same happened with mortgage lending. So if you look at this, and, and this is not as some kind of doctored uh, fake uh, chart uh, that is just a nice curve. It's quite accurate data, even though it looks stylized. Um, it shows the total volume of mortgage lending in Latvia. So you see that basically by by late of, end of 90s, basically the, the, the people had like no mortgages, which is unthinkable in Western European context to have most households uh, having like zero mortgages, uh, which is kind of, uh, and, and then you see how, how uh, especially after accessing the EU, uh, uh, suddenly like this kind of whole mortgage lending exploded. And also, as you see here around 2008, uh, which I guess we all remember, this is the moment when it kind of uh, peaked. Um, and it was really kind of crazy moment when suddenly the apartment became this like unit of economical uh, um, exchange uh, there were new banks uh, offering different kind of uh, mortgage products and uh, new developments were spring springing up everywhere. Uh, mortgage lending was picking up uh, bank banks were literally throwing mortgages at people. Uh, so here you see an advertisement from a bank that ironically actually uh, imploded in 2009 crisis. Um, but this is advertisement that was issued before that, so 2007 or so, when they say that uh, choose a smaller monthly payment for your mortgage. And, and basically trying to advertise their mortgage product to so asking, prompting people to remortgage their housing to, to, to this bank. Uh, and as a bonus, they, they offered a free Samsung LCD TV uh, as a kind of gift for people who, who would make that uh, switch uh, to this bank. So you see that there was kind of like a really kind of a banal, uh, uh, but, but also intensive sense of desperation uh, in terms of like kind of, uh, you know, kind of growing that kind of uh, mortgage portfolio. And of course, we know what happened in 2008, uh, i.e. Uh, a huge market correction uh, that basically kind of eradicated most of the kind of uh, new housing market. And, and in a way, you know, the, the kind of, so, so this kind of incredible decade of growth, uh, like massive economic growth, uh, the people who took mortgages to buy apartments in these new build kind of post-Soviet developments, which were different, who offered, they offered more space and more light, uh, different design, uh, maybe better landscaping, uh, although maybe not not, not not much better quality, um, uh, many of those people kind of uh, got, uh, remain with like kind of insanely high uh, uh, mortgages. Um, and basically, I mean, even after 2008, this kind of like market-led development continued. Uh, I think apartment living still remains the most affordable way, especially for young households to let's say, find their own home uh, and to take a mortgage. So, so in a way now everyone is gradually kind of like getting into this mortgage uh, kind of market. Also because the value of old Soviet apartments that, that were given or privatized is, is diminishing quite a lot. So it's kind of like a, there's a bit of kind of a question how to, how to provide housing for the current generations in a way, or maybe, maybe for people who will need them in five to 10 years in the future. Um, and of course, Another question that I think uh, accumulates to, to the housing question in Latvian context, at least, um, is, is uh, let's say, the kind of question of uh, addressing climate change, uh, the idea that we need to limit our CO2 emissions, we need to limit our energy use. Uh, and in some respect, apartment is a really great kind of site of intervention, because this is like a one thing that is multiplied across the whole landscape. And in a way, if you kind of come up with a policy or an idea, of reducing energy costs for uh, a particular uh, apartment or household, you can scale that uh, on, on, on a country scale and kind of like make an impact, um, at least theoretically. Uh, practically, of course, it doesn't uh, always work like that. Um, so to talk about that, what you see here is uh, one of the installations we commissioned uh, 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 as part of the exhibition as well, uh, which actually represents an actual built uh, master plan that's built in the 1970s in Riga. Uh, and, and those who maybe have seen it in real life, there was this like cold uh, steam coming out from this master plan uh, in the actual exhibition, uh, 
which uh, uh, and, 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 and in a way kind of like deals with those questions of of, of uh, CO two emissions and 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 kind of. Uh, in a way, yeah, the, the question of heat and, and losing uh, and, and the loss of heat uh, on, on a kind of a grand uh, scale. Um, I think on, on top of that, I think nowadays the question of shrinking population, which I think is quite uh, quite noticeable. I think the even idea of sustaining the infrastructure on, on this vast territory that I mentioned in the beginning of this talk is a huge question, right? Um, and in a sense, I think the question of like, what is the role of an apartment in, 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 in a situation when you need to close down uh, schools to maybe even like maybe stop supporting certain roads or, or some even some other infrastructure just because there's not enough of density to uh, 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 let's say be to remain economically viable is very important. So on one hand you have uh, uh, a lot of apartments. On the other hand, they are sp spread out and in, 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 in maybe not, not that concentrated way. Um, and yeah, and, and I think th this is a very kind of difficult, uh, very difficult thing to, uh, in, in a way, d uh, deal with. And what you see here is another book that we published after the exhibition, sort of trying to reflect on the role of apartment living in this, like, especially like in post-2008 condition, which of course, again, from today's perspective seems far away, but again, there are new questions coming, at, coming up, as I said, about climate, about density, about consolidation, maybe about some kind of degrowth of some territories uh, in, and some kind of maybe spatial consolidation of, of the built matter, uh, just all, all, again, just to kind of make it maybe uh, economically uh, viable. Um, and I think, so, and now we arrive in 2000, 20, uh, when suddenly the apartment living uh, be becomes kind of incredibly, almost like inescapable reality for, for let's say, 24-hour cycle for most people. Definitely in Latvia, where there was a strict a strict kind of <laughs> a limit on any kind of movement or, or, or social activity, um, in, and, and apartment literally kind of became this kind of uh, immunological cell, right? And uh, here I'm really appropriating Peter Sloterdijk's term, um, you know, but the, the idea that suddenly like your whole life, your work, your study environment, everything is uh, uh, contained by the same apartment, which in most cases is very small. Uh, if you look at any kind of statistics, you see that especially in Latvia, but many parts of, uh, of the same region, the average size of an apartment is incredibly low. So there is a degree of overcrowding uh, in terms of square meters per person uh, 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 available. Um, and of course, at the moment when you need to introduce new functions, uh, new activities in, in your already small, maybe not that well, uh, 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 kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, kind of uh, adjusted or adopted apartment, I think it's a very difficult thing. And, uh, I was just listening today, there was an interesting kind of a very corporate, very interesting uh, presentation by Ritra, and they were talking about working from home and what does it mean uh, for, for the future. And, and they had this like two approaches. So when suddenly you have to work from home, there are two ways how you can transform your home to make it suitable for work. One way is that you can expand your home, or the other way is that you can partition your home. Now, if you have an apartment, you probably cannot expand your home because it's all constrained by, you know, practical kind of like structures and, and things that are not allowing you to move outwards. So all you can do, of course, is try to re remake your internal kind of environment to maybe compartmentalize your floor area uh, into some kind of different zones that allow you to have these new functions. Um, and again, I, I think that it's, in, I would claim that most of the housing in, in Europe definitely isn't, is not suited for this. Uh, and even worse, uh, it's something that we can maybe more observe in the US, but I'm, I'm sure that it's, it's, it's uh, something that is a more of a global trend that uh, work from home is something that seems to be more adopted on one hand by the employers, which is, you know, a good, probably a good thing for many people. Um, at the same time, I think there are many problems that are in, also implied by that. Uh, for instance, uh, cutting down the salary uh, on the pretext of, you know, the, that uh, somehow people could live uh, uh, in different the geographies, but therefore maybe they wouldn't need to receive the same salary level, or even worse, in some practical terms, it means that offsetting the costs of office space, offsetting the costs of workspace for the workers that is being kind of offset to their own uh, individual units, uh, and probably in most cases without the financial compensation for that. So suddenly, you you would need uh, not just equipment which might be provided, but you need more floor area. You need new spatial setting in your home to accommodate uh, this extra function that your home was not designed for. Uh, right? Uh, you need to accommodate that, uh, and 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 how do you do it? And especially in situation when there's like a condition of overcrowding. Um, 
So I think that that this is actually, I think in, in at least in Latvian context, I think this is where things are standing right now. Um, I think it's important to, and I don't want to kind of promote the current Venice Biennale topic, but I think we should still ask the question, do we want to really live together and do we need to in, in different parts of uh, like of housing? And and, and, and maybe, maybe what is the role of, of the apartment, uh, uh, let's say, both in kind of economical, uh, uh, but also social terms. Um, because I think it's very important to note that that cohabitation uh, doesn't mean collectivity. Uh, and, and, and I think just the idea that there are many, many people, many households uh, condensed together in some kind of like architectural object, it doesn't necessarily imply that uh, there is some kind of synergy going on. And I think maybe this, this is one of the kind of stereotypes that you would see in the, in the West this idea of, oh, that, you know, that this, the Soviet kind of project was very communal and people enjoyed sharing things. And of course, probably many people, maybe some of you disagree with me, but uh, as, as far as I know, it, it wasn't necessarily the case. And, and, and there was still kind of like individual space that was very much kind of important <laughs> for, well, let's say, daily uh, practices. Um, so I think that to, to wrap up, I think the question of dimensions and distances uh, uh, proximities and adjacencies. I mean, I think totally we need to kind of be rethought in terms of both culture, but also territory and, and especially like in, in Northeast European uh, context. Uh, but I think many, so whenever we try to deal with climate change or even like social, social polarization or other things, I think in, in other case, I think the, the apartment as a kind of architectural category Will inevitably will inevitably be part of some kind of equation, and at least this is what, what I, maybe I would I would leave it to uh, tonight. Thank you, thank you, Matt. It's a fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you so much for this wonderful. <clears throat> Um, uh, you know, talk and uh, the materials that you showed is is um, uh, um, definitely unique. All this and uh, the book is very beautiful. So I'm I'm under under um, a very strong impression. Thank you very much. I would love to you know go through the book and if there is a possibility to buy it or order it, please also tell us. But um, I I wanted to you know the the very interesting you know because you presented this you know um development of um kind of idea of individual property in this historical perspective i think it was a very interesting way of how you kind of wrapped it up because it's all recent recent past you know but it's already the past so it's always interesting to address it and to look at it from a contemporary perspective and i just remembered how last year i was passing by riga and i did Airbnb in Riga, and it was an unfinished apartment. And it was very interesting, it was really phenomenal. So that was an apartment that um, was in a building that was newly built, but didn't have the final finish. But since there was the Rammstein concert in town at the time, so this kind of businessman decided, okay, we're gonna make some extra money and just, you know, rent it out. So I come there and in the pictures, it looked a little, it looked okay, just very white. So I arrived there and it's, uh, you know, the apartment was a lot of kind of construction dust with still construction toilet. And I was like, mm, and like, but you can sleep here. It has walls, it has a door and so on. And um, I wanted to ask you, and I think this case is maybe relevant not only to Riga, but also to other uh, cities um, uh, that have this kind of, you know, touristic attractiveness. You know, the, the um, centers in many cities are, um, the apartments in many city centers are owned by investors, people who don't live in these apartments anymore. Um, and they rent them out. And that, uh, of course, changes the, um, the profile of the uh, inhabitants of city centers, which also has been under certain influence during this COVID, um, you know, COVID year. So maybe you could reflect upon that a little bit, how that kind of has um, changed the, the face of Riga in recent years. And uh, what is the situation now and what kind of development in the future, considering the current context you see in that? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I think you should really complain to Airbnb about that. I did. It, <laughs> it, it doesn't sound like a place you, you anyone wants to stay. Uh, it's just, uh, but I think I think it's quite interesting. I mean, I think in general, maybe this is like an uh, adjacent note to what you actually asked, but I think it's good to share. Um, I think the best way to maybe take a look into, let's say, beyond the facade and to see the kind of maybe some true true guises of any culture uh, is to look at. Uh, uh, not Airbnb, but rental apartment listings. Um, 
because that that's where you kind of true see the kind of true true level of kind of like aesthetic refinements or let's say even different tastes or or, or and even furniture. Uh, and I always find it fascinating. Uh, like it's something that, that anyone can do online. You can just take, just do a bit of googling in any country. Just look at apartment listings, and and it's absolutely amazing to see how how different they are uh, uh, from country to country, or let's say differently from region to region. Um, uh, I would I would even make a claim that it's easy to spot differences between let's say Dutch and Danish uh, apartment listings. So just to see. How, how how things are, are kind of actually uh, uh, um, organized. I mean, in regard to kind of like a speculative real estate, a real estate industry that is absorbing everything, I think it's a it should be another kind of uh, conversation and another another maybe talk um, because I think and, and this maybe is it, it's more a hunch than than something that I mean like uh, let's say studied in depth, but. I think that the, the kind of like degree of sameness that maybe is familiar with the you know the kind of post-war housing anywhere in Europe. Uh, in a way, it, 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 of course, now in the market conditions, we see that there is more diversity, at least on the outside. Uh, but I think looking at floor plans or looking at costs or or, or, or affordability or, or 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 looking at some other factors, I think that there is still a lot left to be desired. Um, and my hunch is that for many reasons i think this kind of like model that there's some kind of centralized power whether it's the whether it was the soviet state or whether it's like some kind of big developer um i don't think it's the most feasible way to produce affordable and in a way to some extent tailor-made housing um i think the things that are happening in many parts of western europe most notably probably in in germany uh, this Baugruppen uh, type of development uh, where basically a bunch of uh, households come together, they negotiate particular design and, and then they're more invested in it. And, and as, a, as a result of that, they cut out particular degree of profit margin uh, and they, they could develop something that uh, is more, more affordable and also more adjusted to their lifestyles. I don't want to glorify it. I don't think it's easy. It's anyone who has worked in a large group in a project knows that it, it must be held to agree on, on anything. Um, but at, at the same time, I think it kind of provides, and, and again, like even that kind of development model needs a, a lot of institutional support, especially when it comes to financing and risk. Uh, because of course, you still need to borrow money from a financial institutions. So if someone has to kind of guarantee that because if you're not a developer you need some kind of external party like the municipality to kind of help you to do that but i think i really and i don't want to say that decentralization is the solution to many problems that we are facing today but it's definitely clear that i think that that, that the kind of general market supply in many cases is, is is in some sense not the most optimal way of providing housing um, and of course, the existing things. So, if you don't talk about new builds, but things that are already there and how they are being managed, uh, I think probably again, I, I, you could probably ask some economists, and they could give you a much more nuanced answer. But for instance, I think uh, Netherlands is a good example. How especially Amsterdam, when there are these like large investment kind of conglomerates, basically that are buying up housing uh, uh, and, and just basically, of course, affecting the like they said, the nature of urban. Uh, uh, atmosphere in, 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 in Amsterdam, for instance. But of course, the other important part is that, as I understood at least from a recent event at the U Institute in Rotterdam that I virtually attended, there was a really interesting talk about this, that in a way also because of this multinational kind of interests, uh, that's a really easy way to extract tax revenue from local contexts and, and in a way that the money goes who knows where, but it's not being reinvested into local urban contexts. So and I don't think it's just issue with Airbnb, but I think it's I think we should be more uh, rigorous in looking at these larger kind of uh, I would say in, in, in invest investment uh, entities that that are financing a lot of uh, housing. Um, I recently moved to Denmark uh, and I also moved into a, a new newly built rental apartment. Uh, and when I try to look up who my actual landlord is, I try to Google the name of the company that I had to sign the contract. I just found a website that showed me like a massive network of different companies linked together. And I discovered that uh, the company that owns my apartment changed the ownership uh, like for six times over the last half a year. 
So it's basically like, I think in, in some uh, pragmatic and maybe banal terms, what Keller Easterling calls a special product, uh, uh, this is one of the most best, maybe best kind of depictions of that, that, that is just this network of different flows and the, the kind of newly built housing is just some kind of like a byproduct of that, you know? <laughs> and and I, I don't think it's great. I, I think it's, it's good maybe for, for, for some interest, but I don't think it's good for the end user. Yeah, for sure. No, they're turning into this huge conglomerate and the, the, the interest of the users is the last thing they care about. So it's just, uh, yeah, in, they're in the very end of this kind of hierarchy. Um, the, the, the people who, who rent and the rights, I think, are being, you know, shrinking, especially in larger cities. Okay, um, any questions to Matis? Do you guys want to write them here in chat and Annie and I will, will moderate them? maybe comments to what has been uh, said or some remarks from our audience. I have a question actually, I would like to come back to, uh, to the beginning of your, uh, of, your uh, of your presentation when you uh, marked that uh, you would like to give your presentation from a perspective as an architect and that you're not economist, you're not sociologist, you're not politician, and you're not psychiatrist. <laughs> I mean, you didn't say all of that, but anyways. So, and which made me think also like about um, like how we can find, I mean, I'm talking now about your personal, uh, um, my question is about your personal stance about the, uh, how legitimate is uh, for us saying like uh, people that are work in a cultural field and uh, not specialist in any of this field connected to uh, uh, housing, how it is uh, legitimate to talk about uh, uh, this particular uh, matter as uh, uh, housing and uh, um, sort of, um, um, I guess, and in general with uh, about the socio-political very important question that it is concerned everyone, but at the same time, uh, it's um, it's a kind of we we searching for this language how to how to formulate it. How do you uh, decide it for yourself? <laughs> right, <laughs> I see many layers of your question. Uh, I. <laughs> It's interesting. I mean, uh, yes. So I think one first way to answer this, and I think there are a few ways to give you an answer to this. Um, first way would be that I think, let's say, if people from cultural spheres, architects, curators, well, uh, other cultural workers who don't have the expertise in those all of those issues, I think it's more. I think the fact that that there is an interest, there's a professional interest, there's a conceptual interest in those matters. I think that's more than to engage in those conversations, to look into those materials and, and to try to build new dialogues uh, uh, and maybe also new collaborations, new partnerships. Um, to qualify this uh, statement, uh, and uh, I'm really, uh, our book is totally sold out and you can probably find it in some libraries, but not, not in stores anymore. So I, unfortunately I cannot share it with you. But uh, exactly the, the thing that you pointed out is what we did with our book that we, we did not, Maybe we have like one architect or maybe two architects who contributed to it. Everything else is talking to economists, uh, uh, philosophers, uh, historians, and, and so on. And a lot of material that we gathered actually was quite like original material. We asked them to write basically everything, almost everything is totally new contributions. And, and, and many of those things came, came about as a result of our conversation with them. So let's say historians were very interested in talking to us as architects uh, uh, and urbanists who are part of the curation team, for instance, for the Venice project. Uh, ec economists were interested in talking to us. Uh, uh, we could exchange certain kind of like uh, materials, certain ideas. So I, I think that there's a massive potential for a dialogue because I think it's important to know that just to try to, let's say, put yourself in the other person's shoes. If you're an economist, you also don't know much about architecture. You maybe don't know how the buildings are put together. You don't know maybe that, that well about some certain kind of economies of building production that then architects can contribute. And I think most interesting things come about in, in some kind of overlaps between those, those different spheres of interest. And I think I always, whenever it's possible, I, I try to work in, in this way to, 
kind of try to take architecture as a starting point, but to really reach out uh, as much as possible. And I think especially now when there are so many uh, seemingly high complexity problems that we have to deal with as a society and on the different levels, I think I think it's very difficult to, uh, in some sense, to fully rely on on some kind of defined uh, disciplinary knowledge. Of, yeah, if that answers your question. <laughs> That's, that's uh, sufficient, of course, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any, any questions from uh, our um, I wanted to get audience. back to yeah. the pavilion, um, because there was like, um, how can you maybe talk a little bit more how you were dividing the narrative and how you were constructing it? Because I remember yeah. like the word promise and it was also in, in the book. Yeah. Um, which I, I, I assume was you know, connected with this whole mm-hmm. ideological um, yeah. discourse of uh, you know, property and so on. Could you talk a little bit more of how you were building the narrative of the pavilion? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Uh, and I, I have to confess, I mean, all of us, we had a lot of experience in different projects, but none of us had like, okay, I mean, Gunda Galaivinya, one of our kind of uh, most uh, senior kind of colleagues uh, in, in the team, maybe had like much like amazing experience in like all kinds of massive kind of events uh, of like theater uh, and cultural sector. But let's say in this architecture, we all were in a way kind of trying to uh, figure out what it take, what it means to make a Venice exhibition as we were doing it. Uh, and probably uh, many of you could relate to that, that in a way, when this happens, you of course always make many over and underestimations of, of, the, of different things. Um, so, in a way, I th- and I think this goes back to my, my my point that in a way, this was exhibition made in Venice, but it was not meant fully for Venice. In a way, the the, the kind of real r- residue value of that exhibition, I think, was was and actually is, I think, located in kind of Latvian and kind of Baltic context. And I think that's why also we, we made another book, Other Venice, to kind of like really have all the materials uh, available for everyone. Um, so the way that we did it is that basically, as I mentioned, the housing as a topic was very kind of, there was very limited amount of kind of interest in our sphere. Most of the accounts by historians were like very kind of matter of fact, historical things about which building was built when, by whom, and and, and, and that's it. And so it's very much about the kind of this autobiographical method of uh, looking at architecture without touching any other subjects, just about like almost the architect's life or the building and talking about the facade or window sizes. So we were like, okay, yeah, that's great. But like, what about the kind of political angle of that? What about infrastructure? Uh, what about ecology? All those things are connected. And they were discussed uh, in 20s, in, in 60s, uh, in 90s to some extent. So we were like, okay, well, what about all of those things? So, and I think we, we made them like one of the, like a, a rookie mistake that we invested most of our time uh, and we over-invested our time and resulted in like doing actual research that, you, you know, in many cases, the role of curator is more like, you know, kind of uh, caring for some other things that are already there or maybe exhibiting them or conceptualizing them. In our, in our case, we, we, we had to generate content. We had to really do study. And of course, we couldn't do like a uh, proper PhD kind of grade uh, historical research. So it was very much about kind of like, okay, what is available? Who, we, who do we need to talk to? Who can help us to kind of accelerate this process? It, it was a bit like a like a, almost like a startup uh, situation to kind of quickly scale up this operation. And it was funny because in the beginning, it was like we had a very small team. Uh, it's basically like we, we kind of started playing with this idea with, with, with Evelina and then later other people joined. And in the end, we had like, I don't know, like 30 to 40 people involved in the whole operation. And, 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 and it really kind of went, uh, it, like it was, it was, it was crazy. Um, and but so the way that we structured it after gathering all those things and talking to so many different people, and I think Evelina and Anna did an amazing job going to archives and just like looking at stuff that's not even like marked anywhere or just really trying to trace down particular materials. We also had a really amazing research assistants who who were like historians who helped us to get, gather a lot of things that just were not gathered before. So. I think that, um, and then we, we just thought that this exhibition is like too big for our pavilion in a way that is, again, Venice was, was not the right medium, but it was the right time to do it. So, um, and, and in a way we, we divided the exhibition in four parts. So we, we just like picked four, four themes or four perspectives, how we can look at the apartment. So promise was about this idea of promise, you know, that there's always a better future ahead. 
we're going to modernize, we're going to give you mortgages, we're going to give you this, this idea that there was this like this political and economical structures that were always like using the apartment as kind of like unit of exchange uh, as, as part of some kind of like social contract, whatever it meant in different eras. Uh, then we also looked at a thing that was called distance, and we talked about distances, and as I mentioned in the end of my presentation, it was really about like in this weird condition, this weird spatial condition, uh, uh, this weird uh, geographical condition in Latvia, when, when distance uh, between people and cities and spaces is, is like very weird and disproportional. People live closely together, but then they're very really far apart from other, uh, sometimes other cities, or, or, or let's say that the, the, the kind of holiday density is, is kind of a very uh, asymmetric, I think, in, in Latvian case. Um, so then we talked about things about like what were called uh, heat or warmth. Warmth was the item. So and, and we looked at like the kind of ecological aspect of apart, apart, apartment uh, projects in general. That, that this idea that you have this like uh, a multiple uh, multiple tiny units that are somehow co connected. Uh, uh, and, and then you know what is the kind of like like what does it mean on a mass scale? You know, there's some kind of weird thing of scalability when you think about many many people living in many apartments, as I mentioned in my talk as well. And then the fourth was self and really talking about individualism and trying to see, look, look at the apartment from the ind individual uh, perspective. So we have these like four categories, uh, which is again, like probably much, much too small for at least the Latvian pavilion space that is allocated and for our budget for sure. Uh, even though it, it, it was quite generous, but still. Uh, so we have these four categories and then for each category we we commissioned an installation uh, uh, to artists or designers or architects to really kind of represent that idea looking at a particular project so you saw this like a uh, uh, massive plan that like with a mist coming out from it so that was one for instance uh, so these were like four main objects that were trying to signify those ideas um, and then to kind of document this kind of like state of affairs in Latvian landscape, we also commissioned a, a really good landscape photographer, Reynis Hoffman, is, who basically took his car, drove around the whole country and just took these like amazing landscape photos, trying to kind of really portray this kind of like, uh, again, this condition of this, like uh, in a way like like uh, like uh, emptiness, but also density and, and apartment uh, uh, kind of uh, buildings placed in those different uh, urban and rural co contexts. Um, so there was a, a lot of field work uh, uh, done as well. And those images were like kind of serving as a backdrop uh, for the whole space. Um, and then the last layer, like the kind of micro layer was like really a few few snippets from our archival research, few posters from, 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 from certain eras, just to kind of few elements that kind of like give a bit more context to, to these things. So it was very abstract, but at the same time, it had many layers and it was very, very, very intense. And probably you know Venice Biennale well. It, it's not meant to go in depth, at least not, not the opening week. It's more about just like you know floating through these experiences and not trying to really learn things. Um, so in in that respect, it, it was definitely like a kind of high density exhibition, uh, which later we moved and rebuilt in Riga and, and kind of tried to translate it in Latvian to kind of give it to local audience. Um, and then we had a book where we tried to like really put everything uh, also in, in, in kind of written and, and printed form. So it had many, many different layers, starting from like big and conceptual to like very kind of uh, like a fine grain of particular uh, uh, documents. And looking back at it, I just, I, I cannot understand how, how did we really kind of pull that off, but it kind of worked. <laughs> Yeah, it looked. I'm. I'm. I'm sorry, I didn't see it because it looked um, uh, really good. It's also, I think you know, it also depends on your own perspective. And I think us from coming from this region, when we come to a space like this, we immediately read certain codes. You know, unlike for for audiences from other geographies that might not that might take longer. So, so I think for kind of this part of the world, your pavilion was very much um, was resonating with people's yeah. experiences and just um, you know kind of um, um, education, ideological, historical background. So uh, I would just only add, and I, I think it's, it's, I wanted to kind of declare it on the record. I think that, especially when you talk about the, the the region, right? And I think it's both both the kind of geographical, but also the cultural space that I think is shared to some extent. Um, I think it's also we we should be very kind of critical about well, what we see and what and what we do, and in a way that resonance that and again, of course, there may be there are different ways to qualify that resonance. Uh, but I think that we should try to overcome this kind of fetishization of these like um, certain aesthetic, certain, certain, certain buildings that, you know, are these like mass produced things that we can still find all over the place, basically. 
And of course, that is everyday reality, but that is what, what, what we see. Uh, but I, I think that I hope that there could be a way to maybe find a new, maybe new conceptual framing, but also maybe new visual language, how to move beyond, you know, this kind of like serial, serially produced kind of uh, uh, aesthetic that, that is so overpowering in a way. Um, and, and also just because I, th I think that, that, you know, there has to be some kind of a gradual break when, you know, whenever we talk about like post-Soviet as a condition, it's, it's always like temporary, right? It, it, because post is, is not really like a new thing. It's just like some kind of uh, transition phase. And, and I think that in a way, rethinking the way that we relate and appreciate some of those things is part of trying, trying to kind of move beyond that kind of like ambiguous post-Soviet or whatever a post-socialist uh, uh, condition. And, and I think that especially from the Western perspective, I've always found it kind of, let's say, entertaining when there's this like massive fetish on, I don't know, Soviet bus stops or, or, or Tetris, Tetris blocks that look like Soviet housing in East Berlin that are being, kind of, like all, all those things are, I mean, it's maybe fun and interesting, but I think it's also, it's kind of dragging, is, is, is dragging from, from the past. And, and I think that, that there should be a new way to kind of, I don't know, if not to rebuild them, at least to think about them differently and maybe to put, portray them differently. Um, and I didn't didn't show it to you, but uh, we much, but we worked with a, a young photographer, Eva Rautzepa, who helped us to kind of take some photos uh, for uh, also for the Party Biennale. And it was really amazing. And you can find some in the book. I, I didn't have that many in my slides, but um, we just asked her to go to some of those, actually like these Soviet uh, neighborhoods, like these like this serially produced neighborhoods and take photos of people living there. And she was really kind of focusing on portraits and people's individual experiences. And like, even the way that she, she framed the photos was not this like immense landscape with those windows repeating, but just really like people snapshots of different things. E even that, that, that kind of like uh, visual language kind of helped us as well to think about it a bit differently and try to kind of, uh, in a way, just to kind of lose that abstraction of these like massive repetitive structures. Yeah. No, I think it's very important. And I think this is what, what we are also are trying to do with the series is to decolonize this, you know, view that we're taking for granted for so many years. Plus, it's also, you know, in a certain way connected to certain nostalgia. This is our childhood. And there are, of course, a lot of uh, projects. And I think especially in contemporary photography, uh, there's fetishization and aestheticization of yeah. this, you know, Soviet vlog buildings, for sure. And, and I'm, I'm happy that we're having, you know, your presentation or two weeks ago we had a presentation by Estonian researcher uh, Ingrid Rudi who was talking a lot about Soviet modernism from a feminist perspective and how you know it was all built from this uh, you know very patriarchal position which would put um, women who would live in this um, apartments to a very specific um, uh, you know hierarchy to a very specific place in this hierarchy so I think this kind of um, detached um, view, this kind of defamiliarization is extremely needed when we talk about this um, period in architecture and also this period in um, in creating the social contract, as you said, you know, we're giving you an apartment in exchange to this, this, and this. And of course, in, in you know, it um, is still perceived by, by many people as this huge benefit of, of the Soviet system, which had lots of flaws at the same time. So I think it's important to mention that as well. Yeah, wow. yeah. And, and also I would just add, I would just add, I think it's also, it's important. I, I absolutely agree with you. I think we should like defamiliarize ourselves with all, all of that. Uh, and also just maybe, and, and I don't think it means like, like, like neglecting or forgetting about the Soviet uh, heritage uh, for better or worse. It's also just looking at it also from other facets, you know, I think we should also acknowledge the fact that, especially when we talk about the decolonizing perspective that Soviet system was extractive, right? It was extracting resources and redistributing resources from those territories to different territories. And, and so there's a very strong colonial uh, angle also to the Soviet project. Which I think is kind of like fringe, uh, fringe topic. Uh, at least when I checked last time. Uh, but but I think also the, those those matters I think could offer us other perspectives on understanding these developments. These also the spatial developments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, some uh, someone in the audience is asking you to repeat the name of the on, of the photographers that you that you mentioned. This photographer was um, you know the portraits. Or maybe put it in the chat. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Well, yeah, I'll, I will, I'm doing it right now. I like yeah. the, uh, chatting and talking at the same time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I have a, I have a kind of um, um, question about. Uh, I mean, just wanted to clarify about this. What you said in the in the end, and how you conclude your talk about that. We are in the moment when uh, uh, it's a time to rethink the understanding of apartment from uh, uh, sociological and and not only from economical but but a sociological um, uh, perspective. Um, how do you see the, the question, like a perspective or imaginary question, uh, question uh, of ownership within, within this uh, um, conclusion, I would say, uh, because uh, we see that the uh, pri private ownership or like um, running, uh, running this uh, real estate market and development market by private companies not really uh, helping or not really like making making life or making situation of uh, with housing worse. So, but what is your what is your stand about this? If, for instance, uh, the situation would uh, com uh, the like government would uh, take ownership or responsibility for running that. Uh, part of the human domain or human structure, right? Uh, so can it be improved and uh, will it will be living happier or easier, longer? <laughs> and I, I think it's, I think it's, a, it's really a structural question. Uh, I, I, I would almost, and, and again, I mean, you should really talk, maybe we should talk to some proper policy expert or economist who could give us a more precise perspective um, but of course, I mean, yes, there's one question of who is developing new housing or who is generating new housing and who is orchestrating all that process. Uh, and, and yes, I think there are many things that we could improve. We could find ways how to at least prevent uh, tax money kind of leaving the immediate urban context. We could think of uh, providing more of affordability. Uh, we could think of ways of uh, maybe kind of uh, finding other models of financing or maybe even like uh, I don't know, developing and so on. Um, I think all of those things are, are there, but I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it is about also a lot to do with stagnating real wages, at least in, in, in the West. And I think probably if, if I haven't, I don't know, I don't have the data about the kind of Northeastern Europe part, but, but let's say, you know, the, the idea that like the actual purchasing power uh, has not, hasn't been uh, growing at the same pace as the kind of like overall kind of economic uh, kind of activity or the total volume of kind of GDP and so on. Um, so I, I think it has to do with the fact of some kind of uh, structural inequality that basically things are getting more and more expensive. And I think the good old rule that having a middle class uh, a job guarantees you a house and everything, of course, I think many people acknowledge that it no longer applies because it's just the, the actual cost of things is disproportionate to real uh, economical income. And that's only for middle class people. And maybe also the middle class is hollowing out in many Western societies, at least, probably others as well. I don't know. Uh, I haven't looked into that, but, but this idea that, 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 that there is some kind of like a stable pathway from... I don't know, growing up, establishing your own household, acquiring and not renting your own home. It, it's, it's very problematic. It's incredibly difficult. Uh, and at least people of my age, my generation that I talk to about this, it's, it's an incredible uh, uh, struggle. But in the end, end it's like, it, it doesn't mean if you, if, you, if you do or if you don't have a, a decent uh, job or decent economical standing in the society, uh, it's just the fact that uh, the actual kind of market makes it very difficult uh, uh, to enter even in, into that ownership ladder. And of course, again, you could take you can look at different Western European countries at least where these things are stimulated. You have interest rate that is subsidized uh, by by the, by the state and so on. So there are instruments in trying to kind of like allow people to to still uh, kind of like acquire decent housing. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's just a question of, again, uh, it's a question of kind of some kind of structural economic asymmetries uh, between different social classes in a way. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and I, I, it would be great to give a better uh, solution. And you could find many architects who have tried to speculate and develop models of different financing and so on. Uh, and I think they are really val valuable studies, but quite often they are really speculations and not real models because it's quite kind of difficult to gain traction also because it's really com complex the market 
especially from an architectural point of view, to understand how it really works. Um, and yeah, yeah, and, and I think, and then I don't know. I mean, may, maybe maybe ownership is not possible anymore, or or, or it's it's less attainable. And and then it's all about kind of like being a tenant or being a, just renting things, uh, and which also maybe is fine in some contexts, um, but. Of course, it, yeah. It, it, then it's a question about capital accumulation over generations and 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 and, and so on. Which, um, but I think that uh, whatever uh, the solution is, I, I don't think that architects alone can uh, propose something to really make a meaningful difference. Uh, and probably you could say the same thing about I don't know economists or policy makers. I think I think it's a, a kind of a really kind of complex issue. But I think right now in some contexts being mitigated by some kind of uh, fixes issued by the government. But I think in, in the long term, yeah, I think that there's a lot to be kind of uh, uh, explored. Um, and again, I think ownership itself is not necessarily uh, uh, maybe even a, a problem. It's more a question of like, how do you get access to, who gets access to it? And maybe also what are the terms? Um, and I think in, in some respect, actually, I think the kind of Soviet uh, era was interesting because it was almost more about use rights than ownership that, that you, you had pretty much in the in, indefinite access uh, to housing, which was not, uh, if you managed to get it, because it, it was there was always scarcity, right? Uh, but the idea that uh, you were paying rent, but it wasn't something that uh, uh, you could normally lose at least. Probably there are many cases when this happened, but um, so I, I don't know. I, I think it's, uh, <laughs> I think this is the kind of a very big question and I hope that uh, gradually, maybe in in a few years or decades, we, we will arrive at some kind of uh, resolution to this question. Um, but right now, it's uh, yeah, it's not great. I think for many people. Yeah, I, I guess we kind of like uh, pass this point of no return when the government could have like really like take over the uh, the housing question. But the question is now or concern is how much government could really represent rights of citizens within this. Um, uh, um, uh, private market, and uh, uh, I think it, there is a good example, for instance, in Berlin, when the uh, local government implied to the uh, rentees uh, or like a real estate market that uh, uh, trying to regulate the price for rent and uh, uh, price for cost of the apartment. I'm not sure about cost of the apartment, but for rent for sure. So like that, it can't go like. Uh, up to a certain yeah. point. I wish like in, in Russia, maybe uh, there would be some mechanism that would regulate that because, you know, during the uh, this um, uh, pandemic uh, time, the prices for apartments and uh, for real estate went like 30% up and especially in St. Petersburg and, and in, uh, in Moscow. And then there is like, and it goes up and there is no one is really, there is no one is regulating it. No one is just really, able to to control it so there is this uh, people are ready to pay and um, uh, those sellers are ready to raise uh, the price so it's a uh, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's unregulated uh, real estate market is of course a very dangerous thing yeah, but I, th I think I think the, the other end of the same spectrum is I think uh, city of Stockholm is a good example I don't know what is the situation there now but at least a few years ago I believe and someone disagrees or has better info please type it in the chat or comments later if you see this recording uh, as i understand they they for instance had some some degree of rent controls uh in, in like in in the city maybe in the whole country but city for sure and that resulted in uh, scarcity of housing as well because uh supposedly like there was very little incentive to build uh build more because the kind of like profits were capped uh as a result of that rent control. So, so I think that it's also maybe a question that we almost need to kind of uh, zoom out one more level and maybe and look at some kind of more structural question of how how certain capital uh, is accessed and relocated to and converted into housing. And that maybe goes beyond just, just, just um, regulating what developers do. Uh, uh, and, and again, I, I think it's really like like a like a difficult question because every different context, even every different city, has different solution. Right? You, you could talk with someone from Vienna, and they will probably tell you a success story that everyone is impressed by, or you could talk to someone from Singapore, and probably they will also tell you a more or less good story about whatever is this. Uh, how is it called? How housing Development Board and how how they are providing housing for many people. So I think it's, it's it's a very kind of like a context specific uh, issue, I guess. And I think also, I think when, when we are talking about how to kind of engage with that, I think we should also maybe 
or maybe we're almost required to first situate this discussion in, in a particular context to, to see what are the actual available instruments in a way uh, uh, to, to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. But also with this kind of ownership, you know, it's such a, such a uh, gray area in a way, because, you know, once you uh, f uh, pay your first installment, you think of yourself as an owner, but your apartment still belongs to the bank and, and will belong to the bank for many years, for 30 years. And if you somehow, you know, slip a little bit and you're going to be out, I don't know, of this whole economic system, your 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 ownership will also, will also, will, will also dissolve, you know, so... Uh, and and I think there are kind of more and more cases um, like that, and will be, and you know, with economy being less and less stable, and with kind of jobs changing and job market changing, um, I think this kind of long-term mortgage um, programs will also somehow be changing because it's impossible to kind of calculate something for thirty years in the world that changes so fast. So I think that that will also be transforming in some near future. Let's see. Yeah. 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 Well, I think um, we we covered lots of uh, important and very pressing oh, issues. And uh, uh, Matis, thank you so very much for really um, remind us of very in a very good way um, um, sum up those very important periods in um, in in history about the um, changing uh, perception of uh, from private houses to apartments from uh, like in the 90s uh, when privatization uh, happened, like how to own actually property until now when uh, during the uh, last one and a half year, I think our perception is really changing towards the uh, living space, uh, uh, built uh, living environment and uh, like ownership as well. I guess the scale of values is also like uh, changing and shaking. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. So we will, we, we're really happy to host you, um, your research, your vision within our platform. And we really try to invite as many um, uh, experts in the question of um, housing uh, from uh, different geographies and from different fields of knowledge uh, and also like from different exper personal experiences as well. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. A real pleasure. And uh, I don't know, It's um, I think that for Anya and me, this has been a super interesting journey because every yeah. sector um, is very different. And we like always have so many questions and remarks and it turns to be always a super interesting uh, and very you know thought provoking conversation. So I think we covered lots of very interesting topics, not only about the past, but also about the future because it's very vague and scary sometimes. So. Let's keep thinking, and um, it's it's been. And wonderful. stay sane. Stay yeah. sane. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a good evening, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. bye.